where should we begin when we approach political ideas? In 1995, during the heyday of third wave politics in the United States, the multi-generic writer Susan Sontag gave an interview to the Paris Review wherein she describes a writer as someone who pays attention to the world. Whether or not this characteristic is sufficiently defines a writer by our lights and a Sontag's gaze, it becomes a statement of fundamental principle. This principle, which I propose to term the responsibility to perceive, entails the existential commitment to the act of perceiving reality as it is with the knowledge that to do so completely is impossible. These are the words of Stephen March in his uh, paper, The Responsibility to Perceive. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, Pedro. A native of Thousand Oaks, California, Stephen Taylor Marsh graduated from Yale University with a thesis on responsibility, non-normative conscience, and the critique of the absolute other in Jacques Derrida, and then crossed the Atlantic to pursue a master's degree in English and American studies in Oxford. Stephen wrote a thesis on history, community, and the non-representation of war in Thomas Pynchon. Uh, and after um, uh, leaving behind a project on David Foster Wallace uh, that was mentioned in his uh, statement of purpose sent to Brown University, he is now a third-year doctoral student in the Department of English here at Brown. Stephen's current intellectual commitments can probably be summed up as a series of converging inquiries into the project of thinking. His trajectory features many reflections on authors that one can perhaps identify with the American liberal intellectual tradition, but also several Central and Eastern European philosophers, such as, such as uh, Ian Patoshka, Karol Wojtyla, Vaclav Havel. The common thread throughout uh, Stephen's work seems to be an unwavered interest in the meaning of freedom, the politics of dissent, responsibility, and individual life. As Stephen puts it, thinking is a life and death situation. The world is a complicated place, and it's really hard to live in a complicated world where there is no correct answer to the most challenging questions of our times. He prefers to embrace complexity full on, and his writings are a testimony to that. Welcome, Stephen. And I thought that we could perhaps start with a very broad and open-ended question. Um, your work seems to focus on the interrelation between literature and society, and specifically in the role of the public intellectual. So I'd like to start by hearing what kind of being is a writer for you? <laughs> You're start starting me off difficultly, Pedro. I, I, I appreciate it. It's one of the the struggles of thinking, as I, I might say in a paper. So what, what sort of being is the public intellectual? I think that's an, the answer to that question changes a lot over time, and especially in America, where there is a fundamental commitment to a certain subset of principles, so things relating to freedom and equality from the beginning of the United States that evolves over the course of its history. So I think in the American context, a public intellectual is actually not that different from any given writer. I, I think any, in, especially in the American context, and you can see this going back as early as someone like Thoreau or Emerson, people who are otherwise just writing essays or fiction are inherently and always already I think participating in the dialogue of what it means to be an American, what it means to be a citizen of this new country that is at least nominally founded on ideals of pursuing life, liberty, and the pursuit, and the pursuit of happiness. So I think in that case, as, like from the beginning, there is an interrelation of these two things. As you go on, I think there are certain elements of American society that tend to look a bit more like other countries, and therefore you have more division of roles. But even so, I think, and I, this is certainly the case in the research I've done into Susan Sontag so far, as you've mentioned in that lovely intro for me. An extent to which being a writer is about paying attention, and being a writer is about applying conscience 
where a politician or a, or a social leader or a civic leader might not. And being able to do that as an individual as opposed to being a representative of a group. So I think in the broadest sense, the sort of being a public intellectual is, is just somebody who has a conscience and somebody who's willing to pay attention for the, re for the rest of us and, in le and leading the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a fascinating answer that uh, somehow sets the stage for our conversation and leads me to my second question. Your personal trajectory, your biography and your intellectual commitments uh, somehow feature this movement from political sciences to literature and back. So I'd like to ask you, how did that movement uh, uh, change the way that you perceive texts? And how has that somehow shaped the kind of authors that you dialogue with in your work? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because when I graduated from high school and was starting college at Yale, I was certain going in that I was going to be a political science and economics major who was going to go, go to law school afterwards. And that, that changed pretty dramatically after I took, in my second semester at Yale, a class called Introduction to the Theory of Literature. So this is sort of a bog standard literary theory class where we read the canonical French people. We spend a lot of time with Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics. We talked about Derrida, Butler, Foucault, all of the, the sort of big, big uh, ha -ha French names that you might encounter counter in a, a sort of base, base course in literary theory. And I realized when I took that, that the things that I was interested in, in, in politics, questions of how people interrelate with each other, how people develop meaning for themselves, how people think about their society being structured, how people go about their, their lives in a way that seems fitting to them. Those were all the questions that we were talking about when we were talking about Derrida and Foucault and Baudrillard in that literary theory course. So I, I think I realized about that time that ultimately, even though I've moved back and forth between literature and politics, in a, in a way, the question that I've been interested in has always sort of been the same. How do people develop meaning? What does it mean to be free in a world where we don't get good and clear answers almost all of the time? And it's a, it's a complicated question because there isn't a single right answer to it, as you can see in different places and different times across, his, across history. So I, th I think that's ultimately what brings me to literature specifically, is that at any given piece of literature, especially, I tend to work on novels and short stories more than poetry, especially in those forms, each novel is the consolidation and concentration of a human being's consciousness communicated or at least intentional, intended to be communicated to another person. So there's inherently a, a communication that happens in any fiction writing. And that, that just fascinates me as political in and of itself. Thank you so much. Um, now that we're talking about literature, uh, maybe you can move away from the public intellectual to the role of criticism in your own writings, in your own thought. And uh, Lionel Trilling seems to play a huge role in your uh, intellectual trajectory, and specifically what Trilling uh, defines as liberalism's primal imagination that you uh, uh, oftentimes connect uh, to the idea of criticism in America. So I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about uh, Trilling, his role in your own intellectual development, and his ideas about liberalism and criticism. So Trilling is actually an author I came to relatively late. So I had first heard, heard about Trilling while I was doing my master's degree, this English and American studies master's at Oxford. I was taking a class on fiction and autobiography in my first term, so this would have been October to December or so. There, the terms at Oxford are broken into three. And I remember talking with the professor, a, a fellow named Patrick Hayes, about liberal intellectuals in the course of that class because we, we had read, read a bit of um, Susan Sontag's Illness and Metaphor, which is the memoir of her, the, the sort of weirdly distant memoir of her experience with cancer in that class. So he had mentioned Trilling to me as somebody who would be potentially interesting to look into as an exemplar of a certain muscular but still ambivalent writing style. I, I was looking for somebody who, who in the American tradition could complement some of my thinking about Derrida that I had been doing from undergrads. So Der, Derrida, 
I imagine, as somebody who is very invested in the, the mutability of language and the mutability of meaning. So I came to Trilling after that, and just from, from reading some of the essays in his most famous book, the 1950 book, The Liberal Imagination, I was just gobsmacked from the first, first word I read. The, the preface to that book is justly well known, and in there he defines the primal imagination of liberalism as an experience of variousness and possibility. Those are the exact terms he uses. And when I think about criticism, what strikes me about it is that it's able to, it's the genre in which a, a thinking mind is able to apply itself to problems in the world in the most direct possible way. So in the case of Trilling, the, the book is a not systematic work of philosophy, but a book of essays generally about other things. There's a, a chapter about Henry James. There's a chapter about the American author Sherwin Anderson. There's one about um, the, the idea of money in literature. So what, what happens throughout that book is he evolves a certain disposition of thinking. He involves a certain approach to thinking that I, I think in my research has shown at least for me, is rigorous and systematic in its own way, but it's evolved out of an interaction with a particular object. And that is, I think, criticism's greatest virtue, that it is able to, to enter into dialogue, enter into what Trilling would call a dialectic with an object and allow both the object and the thinker to evolve in a way that I don't think is quite as true of more theoretical or philosophical approaches. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um... And precisely in your work, uh, the idea of criticism seems to be uh, uh, inseparable from certain political ideas, specifically the idea of liberalism and, um, uh, and, and neoliberalism, mm -hmm. or what uh, sometimes you uh, 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 mention as versions of freedom. So I'd like to ask you, um, because your work features a great deal of reflection on current political events, how to deal with these, with these versions of freedom, with the idea of disagreement uh, in a time of rising tides of populism, hatred, bigotry, and how do you see uh, the role of the critique in this, in this landscape? Yeah, I, th I think that's actually precisely why we need these sort of ideas now, whether or not my ideas are the ones. I think thinking about some of the, the issues that came up for liberalism in America in the middle of the 20th century is key. Because I think at the, at the end of the day, what I've learned from my research and what I believe very strongly about the political problems that we face is that the contexts vary, but in a lot of cases, the same underlying processes of thought and the same approaches to these questions of meaning are animate across all of them. So in, specifically to focus on the example of neoliberalism that you mentioned in your question, Pedro, I think what, what I find really interesting about what happens in the 20th century is that there is the emergence of what I refer to across my work as the totalitarian mind. So th this is contextually linked to the regimes of Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin in the Third Reich Nazi Germany and in the Soviet Union, respectively, that involve a certain way of person sacrificing their individuality and the, what I think of as their duty to think to a leader figure or to the force of history or et cetera in exchange for some degree of intellectual comfort. So that, that idea of people wanting to escape difficulty is, is very meaningful for me because I think it's something that doesn't get invented in the 1930s. It's something that's true, it, it's, it's not particularly trendy in academic circles to say things like this, but true of all of human history, that there is a specific way of thinking about being in the world that seeks to abdicate some of the, the things that make it hard, the, the things that make it difficult on the day-to-day -to, -day to think about how complicated the problems we're facing are. But that's precisely why we need liberalism today, because I think neoliberalism is just the next version of that. It, it plays on some of the, the ver it, plays on and abuses some of the virtues of liberalism in pursuit of a corporatized state where nobody feels any obligation to care about a common world or their social lives. So I think ultimately what I'm trying to think of in connection with the current political moment is how we can get people to start 
seeing difficulty as a virtue, something worth struggling through, as opposed to something to avoid. And that means talking to, potentially talking to people across the political aisle, but knowing where one stands morally, being willing to take those stands, even when it subjects one to social difficulty or criticism. Like embr the embrace of difficulty, I think, is the number one thing to get out of it. Thank you. Before we finish, Stephen, yes. I'd like to uh, challenge you to a word association game <laughs> in which I run through a list of words and I will ask you to please share with us the first word that came to your mind. Is that okay? Can I use two or three words if necessary? Or does it have two to be one? at the most. I'll try my best. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Thank you. Global warming. First mm. word. True. Inherent vice. Uh, great movie. Populism. Contemporary challenge. Ideology. Everywhere. Positionality. Mm. Mindfulness. George W. Bush. <laughs> uh, don't get me started. <laughs> Late capitalism. New totalitarianism. Aesthetics. Also everywhere. And finally, hope. We need it? Question mark. That's five, I'm sorry. Ah, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you very much, Pedro.